Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Uh, as Catherine mentioned, we'd like this session to be as interactive as possible, so please do submit questions through the chat interface. I'll be selecting questions as we go along, and we'll also have a Q&A segment at the end of today's webcast. Just a few opening notes before I turn it over to Chris. Today's presenter is Chris Brogan. Chris is president of New Marketing Labs, a new media marketing agency, as well as the home of the New Marketing Summit conferences and New Marketing Boot Camp educational events. He helps large and mid-sized businesses understand how to use social media tools like blogging, social networks, community platforms, and more to build business value for marketers, sales organizations, and internal collaboration in general. We're thrilled to have Chris with us today. Chris, thank you for being with us. You there, Chris? I think he's still Oh, here. I'm here. Okay. I'm here. I'm here. Good. You know, I'm, I'm a big fan of, you know, muting for good sound quality. What can I say? I'm really happy to be here, Mac, and thank you so much for having me on board. Does that mean I should push buttons at this point and all that kind of fun stuff? Sure thing. Sure thing. Feel free to push buttons. All right. Now, everybody who's in the chat can feel free to let me know if I'm going a little too fast for the screens to, to res, but hopefully that we're seeing it all at the same time. I'm really excited about this presentation. I, I'm happy because it gives me an opportunity to talk about two things that I'm passionate about in the same uh, sentence. I've been a book lover since you know before I knew that I was a book lover. Uh, I started to read very, very early. Uh, my first sets of books that I was reading out of were things like uh, Stuart Little, Charlotte's Web, and Trumpet of the Swan, which came in this nifty little three-book set. I grew up in libraries such that when I was 13 years old, if you wanted to find me in my small town, this is before there were cell phones, You'd call the library to see where I was. So, you know, books are in my blood, and so is this whole idea of social media and what it can maybe do for publishers and uh, the whole information industry as a whole. The way I'm going to present is uh, talk just a little bit about what social media means, and the way I use it, I use it more or less like a two-way. The definition I use is just it's the two-way web. It's pretty much any interaction that allows for two-way. So, in my mind, even some of what goes on inside the covers at Amazon.com is social media to me because it allows for a sort of a participatory experience. I can read other people's reviews. I can comment back and forth. They've sort of tucked those wikis and other things in there. So it gives me an opportunity. But we've, of course, gone so much further along than that right now. Um, so just a really quick one for the few people in the room who maybe don't know me, haven't seen me. That's my strange head. I look something like that. I'm wearing a different shirt today. That's me. So the entire presentation, that's who's talking to you, unless Mac jumps in and says, shut up, Brogan. So I want to get right into it. And I don't normally do sort of an agenda slide, but you know, I feel a little bit intimidated that I'm talking to a bunch of brilliant people that actually start their books at the table of contents instead of writing all over the place. Um, so basically, I want to go along this rough uh, outline of landscape strategy actions, costs, and Q&A. And I'm going to blaze through to get to the Q&A, because really the, the benefit of going to something like this and doing it live is that you can ask me a whole bunch of questions. Uh, versus the opportunity to uh, listen into the webinar later and you know get a sense of what you missed. Um, by the way, I, I think Matt mentioned it at the beginning. I was busy trying to unmute myself, um, you know, but I'm also going to get the opportunity to do this live in New York sometime in March for uh, Tools of Change. So I'm excited about that. So I want to talk just a little bit about the landscape and you know what are these tools for social media and you know why why should they matter to you in the in the book world? I was really excited to find a lot of opportunities. Uh, to, to learn about this, but the first thing I want to mention is something you all know already, is that we are the most atomized culture ever. And by atomized, our time is so split, and we are so distracted, and there's always stuff on the go. And it's really hard. I mean, especially when you look back at the great classics and, and the way books were presented in the past. Look at Melville and pick up Moby Dick and think of that book as something that you're going to read back and forth in the office or in between Twitter and in between coffee breaks and things like that. It just won't work. That book just does not work well in a society that is all about velocity. So I just want to say that first and foremost, that's, that's an issue to, to concern yourself with, is that this is a very atomized culture. By the way, when finding that photo, I was pretty happy with the little hula dancer in the front. So there's an office setup you can get behind. Blogs are one way that people are starting to consume their information. And I don't know if you can notice that, but that's also Chris Webb uh, of Wiley. A little disclosure, uh, Chris was my publisher at Wiley for an upcoming book that I'm writing. Uh, and I've, I've since moved over to a different group within it. Um, but the reason that all happened is through social media. Chris knew me from the web before I had a book deal. And Chris and Ellen Gersten knew me from out and about through social media experiences. 
But I mean, some of your own and some of your own best people are doing some really, really great uh, stuff in this industry. And I mean, this this one site, ckweb.com, is loaded with with information for people understanding how to get into publishing and all that sort of stuff. It's not widely specific. It's good advice for people. Um, I really loved the. If you look in the right sidebar, you see five ways to get me to quickly reject your book proposal. Um, I violated a few of those five. So I just want to say it's definitely, definitely a lot of fun. Oh, hi, Alan. She's in chat. Also, I wanted to bring up another really great blog that I like called Books on the Nightstand. Um, this is uh, Anne and Michael, who are also both on the call. And uh, this is a book uh, group of people who are uh, both in the professional business of publishing, but also who just love books like I do and want to talk about great books to read. And so what I love about this is there's already people doing great social media work in this space already. So I'm pretty happy about that. And uh, there's a couple of things to say about this. Well, one is that blogs give us an opportunity to have interactions. So if you're the famous author, Neil Gaiman, who has a rabid, rabid following, you have the opportunity to have conversations back and forth. And it's funny, when I, when I went and grabbed a snapshot of his blog, he was writing about Twitter and whether or not he should get on Twitter. And what he was saying was basically he seems like he feels like it would be sort of self-serving and stupid. But it was funny because I went there first. I went to look at Twitter and see what, uh, you know, whether or not Neil had a, a page there. And so he had actually answered the question on his blog. Uh, he's been using this for a long time. Neil has had a website and a blog running for several years, and it's allowed him a very different relationship with his fans. So I know that that's very unique to the different kinds of authors you have. And I know not every author wants even more pages to fill in. But when there's an opportunity and when there's a chance to kind of you know, build a presence and a platform around your author, that's an important thing to consider. And if it's nothing more than just sort of facilitating the technology part, because you know, Neil didn't exactly cook this blog up himself. He had people work with him on it. That's a really inexpensive service to offer your authors. And that gives you a whole bunch of things, including organic search opportunities. It gives you quality content that people feel like they're getting out and around the book. And it gives you an opportunity to uh, have one more point of presence where you can do starting um, from and start to build relationships with. So blogs is really one of the first pieces of the landscape that even though for a lot of us, it's, it's old. I mean, I started blogging back in 1998 when it was called journaling, um, which I guess Neil still calls his a journal. Uh, it's, it's still one of those things that has value and gives you lots of good recurring quality content. Um, Facebook. Uh, Facebook isn't just for kids anymore. A lot of us on the call are aware of that. I mean, the fastest growing vertical inside of Facebook right now is roughly the 35 to 57-year-old range. Um, there's you know, a big, huge percentage of people growing into this space and doing all kinds of stuff on it. What Facebook allows for is slightly different. It allows for sort of a more fan-based type relationship where you can have everyone has a presence and everyone has some interaction. And I don't necessarily recommend Facebook be the only point of presence for an author because I think that that sort of uh, restricts people from getting to all your stuff. I will say also that the um, the one thing you can do with Facebook, and I'll talk about it later, is use it as part of an outpost strategy, meaning all of the different kinds of things I do out on the web also flow through my news and information stream on Facebook, which means other whole crowds of people get an opportunity to see what I'm doing. So if you can look at my example, if you can sort of squint at the screen, you can see that I wrote a little note on my thing saying that I'm uh, you know, giving away a webinar for publishers tomorrow, um, and that uh, on my status it says I'm sharing social media tips with publishers. Well, those things go through a little stream, and then people start asking whether or not they can be involved in it. So it really gives, it gives sort of some opportunities to uh, interact. Facebook also had a lot of groups. I started looking around for groups with the word books in the title. I found the official Powell City of Books fan club. That's no surprise to any of us that Powell's has fans. Um, but interestingly to me is that there's only 4,000 of them on Facebook. I think they need to know a little bit more that it's out there. I also like that the band book group was there. And so there's 5,100 people inside the band book group. Now, my strategy there for you and uh, you know, sort of a takeaway on this is don't necessarily, unless you've got the most amazing brand in the world, try to do it something that you can actually promote your books and other books. Do something a lot more uh, common ground. I mean, uh, in my example of books on the nightstand, I mean, Anne has a, an alliance to a publisher, but she certainly does review and, p and pay heed and give love to lots of other books. Hell, she mailed me a book from another publisher just because she thought it was a really awesome book, and it was. So definitely, I, I give the sense that you should uh, pay attention to how you want to do that. 
bookstores have set up their own kinds of uh, user accounts there, and Facebook has rules kind of against this, and I don't know if they've changed that. Um, but you know, places like Pages and Port Richards had users called Pages and Port Richards and whatnot. So I found that interesting. But again, terms of service for Facebook say that it's for humans, and that for businesses you should make sort of a fan page. And unless that's changed, then you're all welcome to disagree. Um, that's a risky strategy because if Facebook disables your user account, and they sure do, uh, it means you might lose all the equity that you've built up in that in that space. So pay attention to that. I also looked around for you know publishers, and I found some. That's just using the search feature inside of Facebook. Ah, uh, Twitter. A good chunk of you, I see a lot of at signs, and that tells me a good chunk of Twitter's in the audience. Uh, but for those, you know, 20 of you who are saying, what's Twitter and why should I bother doing Twitter, uh, in a way it sort of feels cultish until you're on the inside of it. And I promise you that if you sign up for this service, and I'll explain what it is in a second, uh, you will think that it's the worst idea that you ever heard in your whole life. because. It just when, when you first dive in, you don't really know who to follow. You don't know who's got interesting information. You don't understand all the protocols right away. And it starts to be a little bit confusing. Uh, Twitter is essentially a, a platform for uh, one-to-many communications. And it, this is the web-facing side of Twitter. But you also can use a, a third-party application on a phone or a third-party application on your desktop. Or you can use SMS if you're in the United States. And this basically allows you to send a 140-character message to anybody who has opted into it. Some people consider it a microblogging platform. I find lots more people uh, are not using it as microblogging as they are more sort of communications points. And if you even just look at this example here, there are two uh, messages in that little vision of my screen, or three, I guess, that are, that are more informational. And then all the ones that have read in it, like uh, at Lara Alexander, are me talking back and forth to people. It turns out that most people on Twitter don't especially like someone who's just blurting out information all day. So if all you're doing is talking about your new book releases, no one's going to really pay attention after a short amount of time. But for example, I went into Twitter and I looked around and oops, I must have moved my mouse. OK. I found Warren Ellis. Warren's quite an author. Uh, he, he writes a lot of genre fiction. And uh, he, has, he has quite a following. He also kind of plays himself up pretty hard. Um, and I would say that um, what's great about him, though, is he's really doing a lot of um, interaction with his crowd. He's doing a lot of back and forth with his people. He's only following 95 people. He's got 11,000 followers. So that it's sort of a something to watch. That's in the upper right-hand corner where I'm talking about that. That sort of means that he's chosen to use the, the listening side of tool to not exactly um, communicate with everybody, but instead what he's going to do is just sort of watch the 95 people. He probably uses something like a search tool to see when people are talking about him. But other than that, he's got a lot of people paying on attention. Uh, so I also found author Paulo Coelho. And if I said his name wrong, don't kill me. Um, it was really interesting, two things in a row. One is I found him. Two is uh, three things. Two is I loved his background, because those are all different people holding up copies of his books. So he made his background all of the people who support him. And I think that's a really neat way to kind of come back um, to your audience and say that. When I followed him, because I sort of mentioned, and I forget who was kind enough to point out that he was on Twitter, I asked that question last night. Uh, he, got a, he got a whole bunch of different people um, following him all of a sudden. And so he responded back to me. And I, you know, no matter who you are, you do get kind of a little you know, happy feeling in your belly when a nice famous person writes you back. And uh, he's a really good conversationalist. Um, Susan Piper and I were having a conversation. I was asking you know, for uh, you know, sort of well-known authors and all that. And she said, well, I'm a well-known author. And so I added her to my slide deck. And then she said, at least I'm well-known around my, uh, my, my kitchen table. And I like, that. I like that kind of a bravado, because one of the things that I had in the conversation last night is, we're all publishers. Uh, this, this is a real difference the way, to the way the book world was and the way the information exchange world was, is there is a whole new universe of Gutenberg out there with blogs, with uh, self-publishing opportunities and all that. And sure, a whole bunch of you just rolled your eyes and said some of it's crap. And yes, a whole lot of self-published books really could have done with a really decent editor. But it doesn't matter to the masses. It turns out that there's an opportunity there and people can get into it. I'll talk a little bit about that later. 
Powell's was interesting too. I really like this because what they're announcing here is they said because there's a bit of a storm, uh, they had to you know cut off the uh, store hours a certain day, and some people started complaining about it. And they said, you know, we're really really sorry. We changed the message. We're trying to get out of the city because of the you know bad weather, and sorry about that. And so it was really interesting that they had a real live conversation back and forth and with their audience in a, in a store way. Now, if you look at that, that's customer service moved on to the web. And there's lots of examples outside of the publishing vertical. The most famous probably would be Comcast with Comcast Cares. There's a guy named Frank Eliason who started answering customer service questions on Twitter. There's a few million people on Twitter, and it is really growing fast and faster. Uh, and it's this thing that uh, CEO Marcel Lebrun from Radian 6 calls the social phone. It turns out there's all these new communications being communication tools being used, and you can think of it as the social phone is ringing. The question is, uh, are you there to answer the social phone? And that you know sort of plays to listening. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But what I liked is I, I like seeing that Powell's was listening and that people are uh, engaging with them. Tim O'Reilly, uh, you might have heard of the guy. Um, he might possibly be related to the people uh, hosting this webinar. Uh, is having lots of conversations on Twitter, and he's 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 both talking back and forth on you know new books that have come out and all that sort of thing, but also questions, information, etc. And he's got a fairly active following. Uh, again, you can see that he's sort of chosen the I don't want to listen to everybody right now because it makes Twitter kind of hard to manage. But he does have a lot of people kind of watching what he's doing and paying attention to him and. Uh, that's really useful. So it's good to have this sort of outlet where you can have conversations. And yes, I realize I'm talking a whole lot about Twitter, but that's really where a lot of the action is right now and sort of the first move kind of opportunities. Um, John Battelle, uh, Federated Media, and also he wrote the book, The Search. He and I were talking about publishers last night. If you can look down below the most recent search, it says, at Chris Brogan, we're all publishers now. I mean, that's the point I was making. It turns out you know, we all have the tools. We all are publishing. And it does really mean a whole lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, the other thing he points out is, of course, that he wrote the book, The Search, so uh, about Google. And so, of course, I had to add him into my pile there. The really secret power of Twitter, though, isn't in just having the conversations back and forth. It's at search. Search.twitter.com is the super secret powerful trick. If you go there, you can start searching for interesting things. What I, what I did on this particular search was I put the words book and gift and to see anybody talking about best ofs or gift books or anything like that because those are opportunities. Those are opportunities to find passionate book buyers and that's an opportunity to start marketing if you have a nice gentle relationship with them. That doesn't mean, oh, you're talking about books. Here's my junk. It means start with a relationship. It means start with uh, getting into a conversation with these folks. And so I did want to say that Using a tool like Twitter search is the secret power of Twitter. It's not just the conversations. It's this piece of it, it's using the search tool. For example, I also searched on great book. How would you love to be paying attention every time someone's talking about a great book? And you know the difference. You know what's in your catalog that is not a great book, but that's just something you hope you get 5,000 copies out of, versus the stuff that you do consider the absolute best and somehow unheard piece of uh, information out there. By the way, Tim Ferriss, the author of the 4-Hour Workweek, talks a lot about how it went. He went from using traditional PR and traditional publicity to try to get his book famous uh, to switching strictly to social media. He just felt he wasn't getting the return on the investment. And I tell you, it was a big difference in how he got it out there. He got lots of bloggers, lots of video bloggers, lots of podcasters to start spreading the message on what they thought about the book and what, if they liked the book. And he started going to all the places where we were, and we became his virus for him. So. Getting the right kinds of uh, relationships in this space is real business. I mean, the last time I was uh, hanging out with Tim was when he got the phone call that his book had been 52 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. And boy, I hope the next time I see him, my book's been on there 52 weeks. Um, I also put in just uh, O'Reilly and book because it allows you the opportunity to start looking for your publishing company. And it gives you the opportunity to see what people are doing and how they're talking about books. And I think what happens here is a couple things. It allows marketers the opportunity to think about uh, how to reach new audiences. It also gives you product ideas. Sometimes people are trying to use your book in a different way that you didn't expect. And maybe there's an opportunity for a follow-on product or a sale product. And so I think it's important that you, you keep your eyes on how Twitter search can do this. This one I just put the word publisher. And I was talking about some different kinds of opportunities. 
One of them I found was kind of interesting was that Candy Blog said, it is sad or funny that my royalty check from my publisher for the past two years is smaller than my blogads.com payment for the last three months. Um, I actually, you know, everybody knows that book authors, you know, think that they're going to get millions and millions for their book and that it doesn't always work that way. But it's funny how many of them, once they catch on that they can actually be an affiliate seller of their own book, actually get money twice for every book they sell if they sell it through their own, say, Amazon links or other services like Borders and Barnes and Noble. Uh, the distributors are paying attention to it as well. I want to talk a little bit about YouTube because if you haven't been paying attention to this, YouTube is definitely uh, an interesting experience right now with books. There's a lot of people making book trailers. People are spending money on doing uh, book trailers right now, and it's really interesting to me. Um, the bottom one on that list aside, I mean, Jody B. Peekle has a, uh, a trailer in there. There's one for... Um, a whole bunch of other books that I've never actually heard of, but that in every case I was willing to sort of go through and watch this on YouTube. YouTube, I think last month was when they crossed the 13 billion views in one month time frame. 13 billion views in one month. I just want that number to set in on your head, because if you're thinking that YouTube is in the place to publish books, think again. It turns out that YouTube might be a great place to put some information about your book in, in the right hands. Uh, this is uh, Scott Sigler at... Uh, 40 minutes from now, a post will come live on my site for Scott Sigler's new book called Contagious. Uh, that trailer, if you Google for, or go to YouTube, sorry, search for Contagious trailer, Scott's a really interesting story. He's a, he's a podcaster who, who was writing a lot of fiction, usually horror and genre fiction, and Scott was not really getting the door knocked on too well for his books. Nobody really cared. And what happened was this. He, um, I'm going to go back and answer your question, Neil, in a second. Um, Scott uh, had a situation where he decided to make a podcast out of his book, and he did serialized content, and it was amazingly successful, and he did a lot of downloads of that podcast, and a lot of people got interested. Well, then what he was able to do is he was able to take those numbers to a publisher and say, hey, look, I have a huge following, and I have a lot of downloads, and people do want this book, and he got the deal. And now Scott's doing another book, and he's got the deal as well, and he actually convinced the, I think he's working with Crown, you know, you can tell me I'm wrong on that. Um, I think he got the deal such that he's giving away a, a serialized podcast again for the book, and he's giving away a PDF serialized for the book as well, uh, alongside of selling the book. The book comes out uh, right around New Year's, like December 30th, but he's doing that ahead of time. By the by, if you happen to, uh, thank you, Michael, if you happen to uh, look at that trailer, it's a little uh, disturbing, one might say, so uh, just be forewarned. Um, Yale had asked a question about, you know, look at the views on these things. I mean, that thing's been viewed 1,500 times. Uh, some of those other ones have been viewed, like Jody Pico, 21,000. 21,000 uh, active live views of a video is way better than a lot of people's return rate on their paper books, you know, when you're sending out galleys or when you're sending out returns for review and all that. If I got 21,000 eyeballs on it, I don't care that it's not a million because I'm just going to try to get as many people to see it as possible. So I'm not, I'm not really worried. The numbers game is more of a quality of numbers because these people are seeking out this information. And further, look at what you can do with Scott Sigler's trailer. I think that it's uh, better that I can embed this thing. And I did. I embedded this video on my blog for the, the uh, 2 o'clock Eastern time today because it's one more way to have an experience with this book and it will give you another opportunity. Um, also, LinkedIn. People think of LinkedIn as a place to put the digital version of their resume. It's not. It's a live, active network, and it's a live opportunity to get in touch with uh, all of the people that are doing stuff in this space. I was really funny. I was trying to think of ways to search my uh, network and see who I could find. And so I typed in writer. And so I found, I think the number says 120 writers. And I found that that was a, a pretty interesting number. But it's funnier still when I looked for publishers, because I only have 44 of those. So I think that the number's kind of, you know, it's three to one, three writers to every publisher out on my LinkedIn network, if that's any kind of an example of what's on the go. Uh, James asked the question, have I found the new media leads to previously non-readers and buyers? It's not that it leads to people who aren't reading, but it gives you an opportunity to get in front of people who are reading in general, but who are a lot more open and able to um, make, it, make a decision back and forth on what they want to read. And so it gives them an opportunity to... Um, you know, have a, have a sampling. I mean, think of pretty much everybody in this call is probably a passionate reader. And that means you've got the opportunity to say, oh, what's interesting to read? When Ann Kingman sent me the book that she sent me called The Sparrow, and she'll probably give you the info inside the uh, bar, 
The Sparrow was a book I had never heard of. It was kind of a science fiction story involving Jesuits. I hadn't read fiction in a long, long, long time, since 9-11, actually. And Anne sent me this book, and it was beautiful, and it was a wonderful thing to read. And so I got sort of a, uh, I got a really powerful feeling out of the book and really enjoyed it, but it wasn't something I would have read. That's a sort of, that's a one-to-one -one kind of experience. Well, these things like YouTube allow a lot of one-to-many kind of opportunities like that. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the sites. Uh, Cheryl Smith points out that there's Great Reads, which isn't that far away from library thing. There's a lot of these sites popping up. And what they allow most, the part that I'm most excited about, uh, is uh, things like the uh, uh, share, show your books on a shelf or as a list and all that kind of a thing. It's a way to keep getting more and more people doing, uh, you know, sharing for you, doing tagging, uh, actually annotating the web. If you look where it says Get Recommendations, tag your books and explore other tags and all that sort of thing. You can actually even do book reviews and all that. I think it's a really powerful kind of opportunity to uh, do those sorts of things. Um, Lena has a question of whether or not I think social media works better for nonfiction than for business titles. No, not at all. Um, I will say that when I went out searching for different books, one of the first ones I looked for was uh, Twilight, uh, because I'm, I'm seeing so many people go to that movie over and over again. And my wife's seen it three or four times, and then you know she'd already bought the books and loved the first one. And then they just descended from there. Uh, every every subsequent book is just you know more and more agony. There's lots and lots of people talking about fiction books on there as well. I would say that the difference is on social networks, um, depending on the, the pocket of people you get into, it's easier or harder to kind of move the needle. So I mean that's definitely a question. Uh, and and Regina and all these other people are pointing out there's all kinds of other places to do it. Shelfari is another opportunity. There are lots of places to check out these kinds of things. So I want to talk just a little bit about strategy. And one of the most important things I want to say is that uh, Twilight, uh, Twilight, yeah, I'm, ready, I'm reading the comments at the same time. Strategy is the diet. Your goal might be that I want to be a marathon runner, so you'd have to eat a slightly different way. Your goal might be you want to drop 20 pounds. That's a different kind of diet, uh, diet that you'd have to do for that. So there's goals, what you want to do, and then there's strategy, how you want to get at it. And that's what we talk about when we talk about strategy. Some of the strategies that I wanted to talk about, and we get a lot less visual from here on in because we're going to go back and forth on the uh, um, question and answer. Um, some of the strategies that I look at are things like having a home base, and for that I talk about mostly blogs. Uh, outposts, which is how do you get contact through places like Twitter and Facebook and all those other places. Uh, video trailers, which we talked about just a little bit. Should you or shouldn't you do it? Extended content and giveaways. Unique experiences. Here's where the fish are. Put everything on paper, and listening is the new marketing. What I don't remember is, did I put pictures for all this? No. OK. So let's talk through the steps a little bit. Uh, when I say making a home base, one of the first strategies I have for publishers to start getting information out about certain books is to do it about two, two or three different ways. One way is to do it as a, as a broad uh, horizontal. And that's doing something like what Ann and Michael have done with books on the nightstand. Make a place where you can just have conversations about books. And if you're going to talk about books that you published, disclose. If you're going to talk about uh, books that uh, you're passionate about but you didn't publish, great. Make sure you do a, a blend of both in those horizontal blogs. It becomes really obvious really quick if it's only a random house party or only a Harlequin party. Although, I tell you what, probably that, that information doesn't apply to Harlequin because those people are uh, their own little niche for darn sure and pretty active. Um, Sharon Jaffe asked a question about social media book clubs. There's a lot of people doing lots of different kinds of book clubs. Uh, Whitney, uh, by the way, who's in the room as well, Whitney Hoffman, has wanted for a really long time to share sort of the best reading that's going on in social media. And she's actually really definitely one of my early adopter people who recommends most of the best business books that I read in 2008. Um, so home base of making a blog. So there's three. One is the wide band, which is sort of like the books on the nightstand. The other might be for niche content. So there's a lot of people who maybe would uh, relate to a business book kind of a site. By the way, a good example of that would be like 800ceoreads.com, which is all set up for that, as well as being you know, a distributor and all that. It's a great opportunity to allow people to gather around one vertical, and that's you know, sort of executive books and whatnot, and then have those kinds of interactions. They've done a lot with really interesting book marketing as well. Um, my outpost stra oh, uh, the third piece is like a, 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 um, a blog for a very specific kind of author or a very uh, 
personality-based kind of author, like a Neil Gaiman site. If you've got an author that's got some personality and they're welcome to do it, there's really a lot of opportunities to do that kind of a relationship over and over and over again. Outposts. When I talk about outposts, I talk about things like getting on Twitter and Facebook and all those other places. I think that there's a lot of opportunities in outposts to be where the people are. And that goes down to my sort of fish where the fish are. Um, people aren't coming to your website that often. If you're going to go and look for a book, you may or may not go right to Amazon. You might go to BN or Borders. It, it, it depends sort of who your book supplier of choice is. And so I don't want to get into the holy wars of which religion you subscribe to. Uh, I will say that there's a lot of people who are out on other sites having relationships. And there's some, there's some exceptions to the rules. I mean, Beacon Street Girls, in, the, in it's a Boston area of company, has a, uh, a product for like the tween set, sort of the 9 to 12s or whatever. And their site is a social network for that age group. And they've built sort of an, a, an environment around those books because of the passion on them. Not every book will necessarily have that passion play. Those kinds of things will be a, uh, a niche sort of product. But outposts mean that you could also go to the places where your audience is and have those conversations there. You can go onto Facebook and find groups about business in general and you know just make it clear that you're talking about business books. It also is an opportunity, I mean, in more than one way. I mean, I'm mostly kind of talking about book marketing. But if you think about this, this is also, I mean, Alan found me at South by Southwest and gave me a book, uh, an opportunity to pitch for a book deal uh, because we were sitting at a conference together about social media. Um, if you're looking to find authors in certain niches, there's a lot of opportunities to find um, the people that you need out in sort of these new social networks. So if you're looking to do a book on, um, I don't know, cartography, there's people in sites and there's groups on site of big things like Facebook that'll let you find those kinds of things. Uh, Whitney's putting out a podcast called Just One More Book, which is which does a lot of reviews of kids uh, stuff from a, a couple up in Canada that we know. There's lots of ways to kind of get into all these new spaces, and the beauty is because this isn't mainstream media, there there's a lot less sort of restrictions on what kind of content. There's a lot more opportunity of people that will allow you to. Uh, get back and forth with lots of other people of like-mindedness, etc. Uh, as Chris Webb points out, there's an in community for almost everything. There's there's hundreds of thousands of them. That I think at this point, I think it's crossed 100,000. Uh, the video trailers question, strategy-wise, was a question of um, whether or not you should do a video trailer. My point is that probably it's only for passionate fans. It's only for books that would have a really big user. If you're going to just do basically sort of a wiggly slideshow and a couple of voiceovers. Uh, I don't think it's going to sell anything. I think there's lots of other opportunities, though, for doing video stuff. You don't necessarily have to do um, just a video trailer with that, you know, um, that King of All Voices guy kind of a thing. In a world where people read books, this is the next one you should read. You could actually just have conversations. You can grab a flip camera from Flip Video and do like an $87 camera and about five minutes of editing. Or get a guy like Nicholas Chase to put it together, who's in the chat room, who's actually a professional video editor. And you can have something slick for not much money that would actually be more conversational based and give you a better sense of the person behind everything else. Um, when I talk about extended content and giveaways, um, I'll, I'll talk about that just a little bit further more down the road. But it's been really kind of a trend lately for people to make uh, their publishing material such that there's maybe an extra chapter that you can only get at XYZ time, or that maybe there's a uh, an extra piece of information going on outside of the um, the sphere of what you're what you're uh, covering inside the books. It means that you can you can offer things like well, like Strength Finder 2.0. I bought Strength Finder 2.0 almost exclusively so I could get that code because I'd already read the thing at the library. Um, I just wanted to make sure that we could um, you know get that information and do the Strength Finder test myself. So I bought a book just so I could log on to a website and take the test. I mean, what a totally powerful thing. So that's uh, my thing about extended content and giveaways. Unique experiences and capturing them. There's a real lot of opportunities to uh, go out there and, and make really unique experiences around a book. And it might be, I mean, you want to follow one example of that over and over again is how Seth Godin has marketed each one of his books. Free Prize Inside was a whole different kind of a thing than uh, what he did with The Big Move. And Everything was different with the dip, and everything else was very different with uh, what he's done recently with tribes. 
And in every single case, Seth has done something different with his book marketing that has translated internal to the book and or has also been outside of um, the experience of, uh, of what he's trying to promote. Like uh, uh, Michael points out uh, what he did with tribes. And it's, what, I did, what I was excited about is I was one of the first couple hundred people to join the tribe social network, uh, which is essentially just a pretty Ning site. And I felt really uh, excited about it. And then I felt overwhelmed because as a few more people came in, uh, they were all rabid and passionate and all wanted to kind of get into it. So I think it's, it's, it's kind of interesting how that all goes. Um, and I'd answer Laura's question, but Seth has answered it a bunch of times. His opinion is that uh, Seth can't really be the best on Twitter and doesn't really want to be in every single conversation. And so he's chosen Twitter as one of the ones he's not going to engage in. He's pretty responsive in his email, and for how brief he is, it feels like Twitter and um, Fish with the fish are we kind of covered. Um, I did also want to say put everything on paper. This is an expression that we're using inside of my book called Trust Agents, which deals a lot with um, how you can rehumanize the web and how businesses are doing stuff across the web uh, using these new social tools. And when I say put everything on paper, there's a difference in what kinds of things. Like when you're sending out galleys, for example, when you send out galleys, it only really gets to the person who's doing the reading and all that. Are there ways you can do it on the web so that more people can see it? Are PDF galleys something that you want to extend out a little further than your paper book galleys? And a lot of people say, no, 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 because you know, that'll spread, the, you know, no one will ever buy it. it, it it's just kind of not true. The stats aren't exactly holding up to that opinion. It, it seems that what's gone on is that if you, people get the PDF, they either really do want to uh, read the book or they really don't. And they either do read through the whole galley or they don't. And as a guy who has about 200 PDF galleys sitting on my desktop here on my computer, I'll tell you for sure that I've read about six of them beyond the first couple of chapters. Because if I'm on my computer, I'm getting distracted and I'm going to do something else. It turns out that you can actually go and uh, do some reading in places where there's not a computer. And you know that's still actually the way we prefer. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about stuff like the Kindle because I don't have enough experience on it. I'll probably have to pick one of those up this holiday season and uh, ex explore it. Or at least that's what I'm going to tell my wife why I need a Kindle. Um, uh, yes, uh, Yale, to answer the question, my book will be a real life book published by John Wiley sometime in the fall. Um, listening is the new marketing. I think one of the first things I showed you was that, um, <laughs> sorry, there's a giant truck outside here uh, making loud noises. Um, listening was one of the first things I showed you about tr uh, Twitter. I wanted to show you that Twitter was a really important uh, tool, but that the listening part was the important part to me. There was, there was a lot that mattered to me in the listening side of it. So I definitely uh, wanted you to understand that uh, listening is, to me, the new marketing. It turns out that there's a lot of folks uh, who are doing a lot of listening by way of the social web. And they're using either free tools like Google Blog Search or Technorati.com. I'll show you a little bit about that, I think. And or uh, you know, using some of the, the paid tools that are out there. One company I like a lot is Radian 6. There's also tools like BuzzLogic, BuzzMetrics, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Michael and a few others are talking a little bit about audiobooks. And right on the seat beside me is uh, Predictably Irrational by Dan Ariely uh, in CD form. Um, what I'm starting to want in books, by the way, is I'm wanting to be able to buy all the media at once. I want to be able to get the paper book for when I'm not listening to it in audio form. I want the audio form for when I'm driving around in the car. I want an MP3 for when I'm on the plane. And I want a PDF for the times that I want to actually just do reference back and forth on it. I'm starting to wish that I could get that bundle in one time. And publishers have been really resistant to that because they see them all as separate channels. But I'd love to see a study on that. I'd love to see if you even did a test on a couple of your books, maybe your outlier books or your low-level books, would you get more people to buy just uh, you know, sort of a, an all-boat of a book? And it wouldn't, I mean, you wouldn't actually get double. Like, I would not buy the audio CDs for the full price and the book for the full price. But I would probably pay about a third more than the hardcover cost if you'd give me the whole thing in a bundle. And as I know how much it costs to burn an audio CD, I think you could make that deal happen. So I just have that feeling that uh, there's, there's an opportunity out there uh, in packaging and, and sort of bundling that would give us that, that opportunity. And James, you're right, there's a lot of inertia against it. I would say that. Uh, you know, there's also a lot of publishing companies going out of business and losing their shirts. So have all the inertia you want. Someone's going to offer it. And you can either be first or you could be a me too. And we know what those things happen. Let's talk just a hair about action and uh, what, we could, what we should do next. 
Again, I said let's start with listening. One of the first things I want you to do is go to google.com slash reader and start making that your listening software of choice. A whole bunch of people in the room are going to explain why blog lines is better, why net vibes is better, why who cares what is better. The reason that this tool is better is it's faster, it allows you to share content with other people in a simpler way, and it allows you to absorb more information. If you notice the left sidebar of mine where it says what subscriptions I have, I have them broken out into different kinds of categories. The very top category that says 11 me is actually what I'm calling a um, ego feed. And what that means is I look for um, people who are talking about me, people who are talking about my company, people who are talking about PodCamp, which is an event I co-founded and that Whitney Hoffman in the room pretty much runs. Um, I'm looking for all kinds of things that are competitive data and analysis. And that's in the ego feed called me. Um, all the other uh, categories are pretty obvious as well, but that's how I can actually read about 700 different blogs a day and sort of rush through them and figure out what I'm going to pay attention to. Underneath the hood on that listening tool is the opportunity to share with other really good people. I think that there's opportunities to uh, uh, use listening as one of the very first things you do when you get back to your uh, office. Outposts. Set up some presence on several of the sites. So I've already gone through what kinds of sites you want to do that on. And there's a lot of people even inside of this group of people who would be willing to share how to do that in, in, in simple first steps kind of ways if you're uncomfortable about it. But you could set up a presence on a whole bunch of different sites such that you can start having conversations. Don't just put your personality up there and walk away from it. You really do have to kind of maintain the outpost. It does matter um, that you're actually there. The other thing is, I want you to think of something a little different. And Chris Webb, you might remember us talking about this when I was visiting you in Indianapolis. Uh, you're not in the publishing business the way you think you are. You're in the information exchange business. And that is a huge, huge shift that I promise you won't really matter to you for until you actually grasp this over maybe the next 6 to 24 months. And I think that the, the difference is huge. I think the difference is you're not just pushing books forward. You are just moving information back and forth. And it is now two-way. It is no longer, I'm going to get your book. I'm going to get all the book edited. I'm going to put the book out. Oh, and then I'm going to learn, because every other publisher did it, how to accessorize books. God bless Wiley for figuring out Trump University. God bless O'Reilly for the three dozen ways that they've cut their books and sliced their books. Uh, you know, I, I had a really good geek fest sitting in Chris Webb's office looking at all the different O'Reilly books on the shelf and realizing which ones I had and which ones I didn't. Um, it, and, and exactly what Webb says in the, in the chat room, a book is just a format. So there's an opportunity here to, to, to be really attentive to the notion that you're passing information back and forth. And when you think that way, why wouldn't you go out there and buy certain blogs? I mean, for the cost of some of the royalty checks that you're giving out, for the cost of the advance I got on my book, you could probably buy a blog exclusively for a year if you thought that content mattered. And then you can find ways to monetize it. There are ways to monetize most every blog. Not all of them pan out. And yes, we are still experimenting with it. I promise you that you will find some magic in that old silk hat if you look into that. Um, let me just make sure where I am here. OK, community. I want to make sure you think hard about this point, about activating the people that are passionate. I think that there's a social network inside of a lot of books that aren't being exploited. And we're, who really tried to take a first swing at it again was Amazon. Amazon tried to put wikis and discussion groups inside of each book review opportunity. And of course, the reason they do that is they want more opportunities to sell. They want more search material. We could say lots of negative things about why they do it. But it's pretty smart. Seth Godin did it explicitly. Seth Godin said, I'm going to make a tribes website at triibes.com, and that's where we're all going to hang out. But I will say that there's a uh, there's an opportunity to sort of build a social network around and inside certain books. For example, Jim Collins, Good to Great, when that book came out, everybody was freaked out about it. My company's senior team bought like 55 books for the whole senior team and or the whole uh, senior project team as well. And we all had to go around and talk about our hedgehog principles and all that kind of stuff. Think of how many more uh, volume of sales we could have if we had a social network and if we were sort of building more community-based conversations. Now think about whether or not the publisher could manage those kinds of social networks and build those kinds of communities and have opportunities for more selling. I mean, Collins had some spin-off properties that came much later after the fact. But what if there were a community of people actually contributing content that other people wanted access to? Would people pay a subscription, maybe even the cost of a second hardcover book, like 24 bucks a year, to be part of a really active, passionate, 
conversation around certain books. And at that point, by the way, if I could get you 20, think about this for a minute. Think about a really different pricing model. What if I charged you $24.95 for a year's access to a social network where the author and other people who support the author was inside that, that opportunity, and I gave you the book for free? That's what Seth did with tribes, if you think about it. The book isn't the, the book. Isn't the book. The book is the souvenir from the concert known as Tribes. Um, let's see. Let's get to some questions. Uh, anybody self-publishing via via print on demand? Oh hell yeah! Uh, Blurb is one company that you could look at. Blurb dot com. Uh, there's a bunch of others. Lulu dot com. And there's a lot of people. Oh, 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 you mean print on demand, like inside of Borders and that sort of thing? I think I don't know enough about who those people are that are doing that sort of deal. iUniverse is another. Um, I don't know who's actually doing it from those, like say, borders kiosks or whatever. But I think it's I think it's a really great opportunity. I mean, I support small local independent bookstores. Uh, I live in Massachusetts, up in Newburyport, Massachusetts. There's a little independent bookstore that I worked the holiday season on for five years until they changed management, just because I could hand sell books in there and had just such a lot of fun doing that kind of opportunity. So I think there's a lot of opportunities to do print on demand, and I think people will pay for it at a slightly different rate. And it might be sort of a future feeling. Who knows? I mean, there's that thing you get when you feel just the right kind of book. When I grabbed Made the Stick, because of that duct tape cover that cost a lot of money and probably caused a lot of fights internally, uh, that can't be replicated by just a, you know, an orange and gray cover. Let's go to a few more questions. Um, I'm conscious of time, and I think. Chris, can I pop in for a second? Please. Uh, there were a couple of questions. Uh, early going that had to do more with management, things like how do you manage all the different social media options at, at your disposal, uh, and also related to that, how can publishers encourage authors to actively participate in this? So if you could uh, touch on that a little bit. Oh, see, thank you, Mac. And uh, you did mention that you were going to be actually paying attention to all the questions, and so I was just trying to squint my eyes. Um, participating on all the sites is immediately bad and yucky. Um, it's too much work to get involved in all of the sites. And so what I always try to say is look for the site where you might have some uh, benefit and where you can add some value. And look and see if there's, you know, how you can kind of dip your toes in first and then get to learn. For example, joining a site like Twitter, you know, pick a profile name, pick a, an avatar that's hopefully a picture, and then maybe uh, sit and listen for a while. Start following people. Follow people of like interest. And again, how do you find like interest? Go to search.twitter.com. Then go and pay attention to uh, people who seem to have similar terms that they're talking about that you'd be interested in. Go slowly and, and sort of build from one place to another. If you had to pick anywhere to start on any kind of social platform, I still recommend the blog because it, it's an opportunity for people to get inside your head and get a sense of what you're thinking about and where you're coming from. And that's the best kind of promotion. It's a salesman that's there all the, all the time. It's somebody always actively selling your thoughts, your, your perspective, and whatnot, and moves it forward. Uh, Mac, the second part of that question, remind me again? Uh, specifically about how authors can be actively involved in this. And I think that that uh, is something that pops up quite often with publishers because they understand that they need to forge deeper relationships with their authors. But there's also that question of how do you rephrase this so that it doesn't just look like more work that's being shoveled onto the authors. Ah, well, I guess. It, you know, Coming from the writing side of it, I mean, I'm on all sides of it. I feel like I'm a publisher myself, uh, just not books. If, if you're an author and, and you're looking for more volume and you're looking for more relationships, I mean, community is certainly a way to do it. Uh, there's a vast difference between people who have an active fan base versus people who have a user base than people who are uh, you know, just sort of uh, pushing books onto a shelf and walking away from it. And so, I mean, with everything I do with social media, my favorite thing to do is push numbers. If I can move a needle by being, you know, if I could show them that by being involved that they'll actually push more sale, then I think that's usually one way to do it. And it's not just as easy as that. I mean, that's why there's strategists like me who get paid to help people do that sort of thing. That's why there's, you know, probably 100 people in the room that would, you know, sign up and help. Um, and you don't have to go out to the crowds. I mean, you don't have to share every little bite of the, the uh, apple. What you can do is you can... You can certainly are you can certainly make you know the relationships you're comfortable with. Uh, you know, some people don't like crowds. Guess what? It turns out on Twitter, no matter how many people are there, they still won't touch you. You're still safe and how to remove. Did you have some other questions we want to handle? Yeah. 
Uh, I think that touched on it for now. We may want to loop back at a certain point to talk about uh, more metrics. I think that was a question that people were uh, interested about. But uh, I think we probably should just progress, and then maybe we can just come back to that. Well, I mean, I'm uh, I'm at the I'm at the Q and A part of things right now. I mean, I've I've uh, flipped out okay. uh, most most all my decks, so I'm definitely welcome to kind of browse the, the question thing as we go along. Oh, ex excellent. Yeah, that, uh, and I think the question of metrics is something that pops up quite a bit um, when. when when traditional publishers are entering into this space, I, I think it's the business case that inevitably kicks in. Uh, is there a way to correlate social media with direct revenue, or is it a more ambiguous connection? And if that is the case, how do you make that? How do you make the case internally within your own business? Well, I mean, so there's some really interesting uh, experiences with that. For example, I went to a book signing once, and the author was Chuck Martin, who does uh, interesting uh, books on business and whatnot and has been like an advisor to Bill Clinton and all these kinds of big names like that. And he's got this like create, you know, like uh, companies have their like logo slide of who they're amazing because of. Uh, his was huge. And it was just this guy Chuck Martin and myself. And I said, wow, I, I'm a little embarrassed because, you know, here's this great resource and it's just you and me. He goes, let me tell you something. For a month, Barnes & Noble has had my sign and my name over by the door. For months, I haven't seen more sales out of Barnes & Noble. People see it, they jot it down on a piece of paper, they go home and they order it from Amazon or they order it from Powell's or they order it from wherever they really want to be you know, buying their books. They may or may not buy it in the store. So what happens is exactly what you're saying about metrics. It, it's really hard to measure because it's not always a direct and straightforward relationship between where you're actually getting the spark in your head that you need a book and where you actually purchase the book. Uh, since getting an iPhone, I take pictures of books all the time now so that I can remember and go back and, and, and write down what's going on. Um, Jacob Morton and Morgan in the chat room actually talks about measures of uh, success in social products. I would say that there's a lot of different ways to look at it. I love trying to bring it all the way back to revenue. So what I what I basically do is, you know, where's your revenue number now? And if you're not doing any other kind of marketing, and I do the social media work, and the number goes up, then maybe I've been successful, or maybe magic happened. But I can, if I can do it two months in a row, then I feel like I'm successful. I only did it the one month in a row, then it feels sort of like magic. So I guess in my mind, it, it's always in it, the number that always matters, and I get this from Chris Penn from the Financial Aid Podcast, uh, the number that seems to matter the most to, to impress an author or impress a publisher to keep doing something is money. Uh, and so if I can sell more product and if I can get more people attached to it, that's way better to me than page views. That's way better to me than how many people saw my YouTube video. It's good I sell more books. Um, oh, uh, there's a question earlier Michael had asked about, you know, if you build it, will they come? Not always. And there's a, there's a lot of opportunities to have sort of that scared, sad, lonely mall kind of a feeling to social networks. And that's why sometimes being on other people's social networks isn't bad. Warren Ellis doesn't necessarily have a Warren Ellis network. Um, you know, MySpace is MySpace because there's millions and millions of people on it. And David Hasselhoff created Hotspace, which is only, you know, 19,000 people. And he feels happy about that. And other people uh, definitely... Uh, you know, have had those kinds of experiences. But Andy points out, if you don't build it, they'll definitely not come. My, my sort of take is a little different. It's sort of like get down towards the middle. And uh, you know, can you do you get any kind of a rise out of people if you use the, the, the uh, larger social networks? Do you get any kind of a following? I mean, Warren Ellis, when we looked at that example, had 20,000 people following him. I mean, that's a pretty decent number. I could you could say that he should have a site that talks about his books in depth and that allows his fan base to interact side to side. That's the real point. It's not, can you get an author to contribute all the time? It's, can you get an author to engage his fan base and his audience in such a way that the audience starts participating back and forth laterally, and that the author is just, you know, icing and gravy to mix metaphors. <laughs> um, we're a small company with a small staff, and we can't cover all these bases. Which are the most important? First, listening, Howard, always listening. Uh, Search.twitter.com, tie the results to it, because you can subscribe to the results into your Google Reader and start paying attention to the things you want to pay attention to. So it's, it's one of those kinds of tasks that you could have somebody do one or two hours a day at the most or even a half hour in the morning, a half hour at night. You know, think about it like exercise. Start small and grow. And I think that's one way to kind of get to that. Back for my time, we have two minutes left or do we have about like a half an hour? I don't remember how long we're supposed to play today. Two minutes. Thanks, Charles Smith. 
Do I think Arianna Huffington has the right area to work together rather than to go it alone? Well, Michael, uh, Arianna Huffington is killing all of the uh, other um, people in the newspaper industry. As newspapers are dying all over the place, her blog, which is accidentally a newspaper, is kicking butt. Do I agree with her side? Do I agree with her perspective? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. No. Um, I, you know, I don't agree with every single piece. Um, but I would say that she's kicking butt. Perez Hilton is killing People magazine. Perez Hilton, you know, this one person, uh, Mario, and I can't remember his name, La Viandera, is killing People magazine and because he was not afraid to do it. The answer is yes. I'll share the slides. Um, there's a lot of opportunities to uh, go out and sort of jump gate, which will actually probably be the second book I read after Trust Agents. There's a lot of opportunities to get out there and really pay attention to uh, ways that people are mired. Somebody said to early on, oh, but there's a lot of old business models and there's a lot of old stuff stacked against doing some of the things that I've recommended. That's awesome. Have a ball. I think that there's a lot of opportunities to let other people come in and steal your, your industry away from you, and then you have to come back and take it again. Uh, it's a lot harder to reclaim it. One an example in a totally different vertical, computers. Uh, nobody was making something called a, no, you know, a netbook type PC. Nobody was making something smaller than a 13-inch laptop. And then this little company called Asus came along and made the ePC. And they sold a gazillion of them. They weren't the best computer in the world, but they were small and they worked. Next thing you know, uh, you had people uh, coming along and um, wanting access to that market. And then Dell and others had to come back and go after that marketplace that they lost. So publishers have an opportunity to lose all kinds of market space as well. Let's, uh, let's go back into the uh, questions and see if there's anything else I can answer. But thanks, everybody, for letting me know the time. What do I know? I just show up. Uh, what I found helpful is your comment about we're no longer in the book publishing business. Oh, well, thank you, Jessica. And I mean, really, that's one of the things to pay attention to. And I'll answer Brian in a second. The, I mean, you're stuck in the view that you want to be stuck in. You're stuck in the way the metrics are already there because the, the road's there. My overused Ralph Waldo Emerson quote, which I always get wrong, is do not go where the path already leads. Go where there's no path and leave a trail. That's important to this, this whole conversation. Um, a lot of people answered Brian saying that WordPress is a great blogging platform. And I, I agree that WordPress is great. I'm seeing some neat new stuff out of Movable Type. I mean, just today, Movable Type announced a new feature uh, that gives it sort of a Twitter inside of the uh, application feature. And I think that's a really good one. Um, I would say that uh, other things to check out, though, there's a company called HubSpot here in Boston. And I'm an advisor on there, which I don't know. If they make $10 billion, I think they send me a pony. Um, HubSpot is an interesting marketing platform because the whole platform is basically a blogging platform with a mountain of, of analytic tools built into it. So if you're looking as a publisher and you're looking to convert and you're looking to actually make more sales and you're looking to sort of build um, all that kind of feature and functionality into a site, HubSpot's kind of interesting to look at. It's a low, it's a low kind of price. There's a lot of other opportunities in sort of baking your own cake and making your own website. And I'm a, I'm a make my own kind of a guy. Kathy says we have a staff Twitter account presently, a free for all. Is that okay, or should there be an eye towards a singular mission? Well, Kathy, one thing that's true is that I mean, this is all a laboratory, and we all certainly have an opportunity to figure out what's going to work. When Frank uh, Eliason was at Comcast Cares, he had no idea that he was suddenly going to get all the mainstream press in the world for being sort of the next phase of customer service. He just saw some problems on the web and decided to answer them. Um, I wanted to also point out that um, you can do a bunch of things. One thing you should do is pay attention to being sort of real and human. You want to see some great examples. Follow Whole Foods, like the Whole Foods market. Follow LA Times. LA Times is a neat story because they very recently went from being sort of a, an RSS feed for their news stories to being a human being. And what was really cool about that was that they had an opportunity to actually start talking back and forth. And I'll admit that they stole it from Colonel Tribune uh, who is part of the Chicago Tribune team. And Colonel's a, uh, uh, some might argue that the Colonel's fictional. I'd say that he might be a strange old man that we haven't met yet. Um, but there's a lot of interesting people behind uh, making the Colonel popular for the Tribune. But I tell you what, humans are actually communicating with these kinds of things. Um, James says part of the problem is that there is no big vision of the man on the moon, uh, you know, of where we're going, sort of man on the moon. That's absolutely true. Everything is, everything big is small. Well, what do you know? Seth Godin already wrote the book. Small is the new big. 
I wrote a blog post fairly recently on chrisbrogan.com called Cafe Shaped Conversations. What if we don't all want to eat at Walmart? What if we don't all want to eat at McDonald's? What if we want little tiny French cafes where there's a lot of individual and unique attention and service? It turns out that that costs a little much to uh, maintain in the mass market side. So all the huge uh, publishers in the world just fainted at thinking about it. But I would say that there's an opportunity to have really niche, uh, almost like the craft beer approach to making good quality products. Think about Jim Cook and what he's done with Sam Adams. Sam Adams is a pretty big brewery that still feels like a very small craft beer uh, when compared to places like InBev or, I mean, Anheuser-Busch in the U.S. Um, it's a whole different kind of experience how that one goes. Um, looking for a couple more questions. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of other uh, there's a lot of other people who are connecting up in in different ways. Let's see, million dollar question: How can we convert page views to cash? Michael, the answer is always the same: equip people with information they need, and then they'll pay something for it. If you had how to write the best sales proposal in the world to close uh, the uh, uh, business that I need to close, I pay for it right now because I need it. If you had any kind of uh, information that I need to close up. Um, then I'll pay for it. One question was, is there a site like a dig, a stumble upon, or a mix, or you know, what will they do for publishers? That's sort of like, how do I actually get the crowd uh, to, how do I get the crowd to do my work for me, basically, with sites like dig.com? It turns out that dig is really averse to marketing efforts. If they, if people smell that it's a marketing effort versus sort of an organic sign, they won't go for it. Mix and and spin, S P H I N N, and Reddit. Um, are definitely um, a little bit more open to potential marketing, but it has to be humanized. It has to be good. It has to be catchy. And it just doesn't seem like it's going to be all that easy for people to do. Let's see. Hey, uh, Chris, there was a, a question just came in from Morris Rosenthal about um, how publishers, <laughs> in many cases, never got Web 1.0 correct, let alone Web 2.0. And how do you feel about publishers rushing into video, Twitter, et cetera, without establishing a basic resource site for their business or enterprise? So I, I guess it's actually that gives you a, probably a good sense of, of where a lot of folks in this industry are coming from. They just uh, got comfortable with Web 1.0. How do they start addressing Web 2.0 if they haven't figured out the 1.0 stuff yet? That's a really great question. I, th I think it's it's funny to me because I think the 2.0 stuff you know, as one would hope, you know, you'd hope the sequel is better than the original. And we know in books and movies that's almost never true. Um, I think this is one case where it is true. And I, I think the reason is that we have humanized the web. And we've started to use all kinds of people um, in, in, in uh, tools to reach people, I mean, in, in, in much more humanized ways. And so, yes, I understand the web 1.0 didn't exactly connect with people. But web, web 1.0 basically set us up with brochureware. It wasn't that hard to get wrong because all we really did was come up with ways to click stuff. And people didn't understand you know, the, the appropriate ways to do hyperlinking. People didn't understand any of this. The difference is what's happened is because there's, you know, amateurs can actually do most of all the stuff that I've talked about, at least on the low end, I could say that um, what you can understand is that um, the tools and the way that people use them is a lot more organic, and people are a lot more intuitive to figuring it out. I feel optimistic, Morris, that people will kind of get it if consulted with, if, if they consult with and make relationships with the audience. My friend Colin from Yahoo talks about bringing wine to the picnic. The problem where marketers and salespeople usually uh, fall into this experience is that they come showing up to the picnic with a bullhorn instead. And they put the bullhorn up to their mouth and go, hey, buy my thing. If you view this as sort of a dinner party, if you view this as sort of a loose cocktail party with multiple conversations, that will kind of start to dictate how you should have the conversation. You know, Nicholas Chase walks into a room and says, hey, I'm a videographer, and you should hire me because I'm really good at my job. He's going to walk out of there with no business cards. Nicholas Chase who walks in and says, hey, guys, how's everybody doing? What's the, what's the topic? And we all start talking about things like old school chat rooms. Uh, he's going to have an affinity. People are going to like him. People are going to walk away and, and have a really good experience with that person, and that can translate to business. I get 100% of my business from people referring themselves to me by way of the fact that I seem like a nice guy and I seem like someone who's interested in what they're doing and I talk to them. Oh, sorry, everybody, that I wrecked your ears, but I did definitely explain the bullhorn. 
Um, I would say that there's a whole opportunity here to start using these tools in a much more human way. And I see that Morris has written a follow-on question that's equally big here. Uh, search is a killer app. Publishers, book publishers are in the best position of all businesses through search. Yeah. So, Morris, I mean, that's, it's a really interesting point. I mean, people went after Google right away when Google started indexing all their books and, you know, all the depth of all their books. And I think it's really, really scary because suddenly you have that feeling. I mean, think about what you're thinking as you hear that. I'm going to index all your book content, and I'm going to make it available on Google. It's the same thing with Amazon Search Inside. When that feature first came out, everybody fainted. And it took a long time for people to buy it. But you know what? I've bought more books because of Search Inside than I have on recommendation alone. And the reason is I need information, and I sometimes don't always get where it is. What happens to me is it's the uh, situation where people can I mean, you've got to ask what you're giving away. Again, are you in the paper book business or are you in the information exchange business? Uh, there's a book that you might all have read, Thomas Friedman's The World is Flat. I bet you 80% of you own the book. I bet you far less read the book. The World is Flat, by the way, I took me the audio book to actually get through it because it's a, it's a chunker. Uh, but The World is Flat talks a lot about value chain disaggregation. It's, it's a whole issue of it turns out the thing you think is valuable isn't really the thing that's valuable. You have to get involved in that book. It's, it's so many years old now that you, if you didn't use that as a strategy point, you blew it already, but you can come back and collect it up. Um, Jacqueline, the answer and everybody else about how can I read and or talk and or think. Uh, you know, I was raised in a, a classroom experiment, experience where there were no walls, and so I could hear every other class around me, and I'm a child of the Internet. So I have basically spent my entire life with more than one window open. So it's just how I'm wired. Um, Let's see, question from Amanda. Oh no, she's just commenting back. Uh, the, other, the other thing about where's the best place to go to get paid ads on your site? Oh boy, Brian, funny you should ask me that question. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a lot of different ways to do that. And for one, there's uh, affiliate marketing. Um, affiliate marketing is going to be a $13 billion business in the US in 2009. And what that means is you can go and find advertisements that actually would match your audience and that would match your interests. And for example, Amazon is an affiliate program. It's one of the most well-known book affiliate programs in the world. There's a lot of things that are flawed with it technologically. It turns out um, there's other, I mean, some of the real tiny nitty-gritty technology on how that affiliate program works isn't as good as others. I looked at a company called Abunga, abunga.com, A-B-U-N-G-A.com, which has less titles but has a slightly better affiliate program. There's lots and lots and lots of opportunities to reach into all those different kinds of uh, affiliate programs and um, you know monetize your site in different ways. I don't know that advertisements all over a blog is the next phase of making money. Uh, for example, uh, one of the people mentioned, it might have been Judy, talked about teleseminars early on and that being social media. Absolutely. By the way, I mean, Seth Godin gives a lot of teleseminars as a, a pr promotion for his books, but there's so many opportunities to, to do small monetizations. I mean, if you had 10 minutes of question and answer back and forth on the Seth Godin on marketing. 10 minutes. Would you pay 20 bucks for that? Would you pay 100 bucks for that? There's opportunities there to make some money that's worth it to the, to the publisher and or worth it to their authors to do that kind of an opportunity. So just start looking way outside of the idea that the money is in the actual piece of paper. Start to pay attention to the idea that the money is in aggregating and distributing information in a useful way and, and slicing the information into new ways. I mean, all of those kind of companion products, you know that there's people who've done it crappy, and then you know there's people who've done it with the heart. And, you know, I mean, you know, I don't owe O'Reilly anything, but I'll give him this big, this big compliment. Those little tiny pocketbooks that come as a, a junk, an adjunct product to a lot of their other books are really helpful to a guy like me when I was a software engineer. When I'd be somewhere down in a data center, I couldn't take a 300-page book down there with me, but I could take a 67-page cookbook. And it was always for something that I was ridiculously bad at, like using VI on Unix or something. Um, those kinds of opportunities are abound. And you, can just, you just have to go after them. And the only real difference is, do you know why people don't try new things? Because there's no measure for it. And again, Ralph Waldo Emerson, go where there's no path and leave a trail. Any other questions I can answer? I still have uh, you know, 15 whole minutes of air I can do here. Okay, Chris, there was a question that popped up in the in the registration. 
uh, and it was it was in regards to the dark side of social networking, where and, and the question was posed as businesses that were tricking people into contributing content. But are there are there caveats? Are there things that people should be looking out for as they enter into this, or or can they jump in with two feet and not really worry about it? Oh boy, I can't think of anything where I'd want to jump in with two feet and not worry about it. Um, I mean, so. Let's start with the one about people contributing content for free and getting it taken. I mean, there's, that's a that's a argument that's been leveraged against YouTube a million billion times. All those people are making video, and YouTube gets 1.65 billion, and I get nothing. Well, no, YouTube built a platform that's distributing your video for free, and they're distributing and uh, hosting your stuff and encoding it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Making money isn't you know inherent in people just creating content. It turns out content doesn't equal money. Content that somebody's interested in and passionate about and will pay for equals money. Um, so on the contributing side, I mean, yes, if you want if you want to do sort of crowdsourced information and sell the, the payload of that, uh, you might have to look into whether or not you owe your audience uh, any kind of a cut for that. If you're going to look into a, a situation where there's just a sort of participatory feel and you're not going to try to monetize it, you know, let's, let's just say that anytime money is thrown into the mix, it's, a, it's an issue. And so if you're going to try to do something for nothing, it will always, always fail. It will always be somebody coming back and griping. There will always be a lawsuit attached to it. It will always leave a bad taste in your mouth. So that's, a, that's sort of my, my cautionary tale for people who want to use, you know, get stuff off the back of others. Uh, but on the other side, too, for prospective authors, I mean, I think there's a bunch of people in this room who came on because they want to be an author. I think that, um, sorry, I'm just reading here. Morris, yeah, I mean, that's it's a scam. So the, the question was, somebody on YouTube, somebody comes to Morris as a YouTuber and says, we'll give you 25 bucks to switch over to our site. I mean, it's a numbers game in those kind of uh, venues as well. Those sites are attracting advertisers and saying, I've got 1 million users, or I've got 10 billion views, and I've got this many uploads, and all that sort of a thing. I would say that um, it's crazy to me that all these different types of uh, places are still playing the numbers game, which we already invalidated the first time the web crashed in uh, the late 90s and into 2001. Um, YouTube is a great place to use content. There's others. There's Diddler. I mean, there's for every site that's out there on the web, there's some other site that does similar stuff, and you could run over to it. Um, it's definitely an opportunity where you can uh, build relationships with people and understand sort of the, the plus and minus before you go for the dark side. Any other questions as we're starting to wind this baby down? Yeah, there's some questions, and, and, and I think this has to do with uh, the nitty-gritty on a on a day-to-day -day basis of giving recommendations on number of hours per day to put into social media products or social media uh, initiatives, and whether or not that's something that could translate from other skill sets that might currently exist within traditional content organizations, or if there are any sort of outsourced opportunities that exist. Because uh, I imagine that with everything that's going on these days with the economy, the idea of investing significantly in this, whether it's an individual person or outsourcing, absolutely factors into the decision as to whether or not to pursue it. Wow, that's like that's like asking me to pitch my own company. Um, <laughs> New marketing New Marketing Labs is set up as a sort of a, a, a way for you to sort of involve yourself in a social media agency as training wheels to get you going. Uh, different than a typical consultancy, which seems to be in existence to uh, you know build themselves projects to work on for years and years. My model is if I you know you know the old saying, give a man a fish and he has smelly hands. Teach a man a fish and he learns how to lie. Um, I've taken that to the nth degree. I believe that if I teach people how to fish, then I can go and work on a new project. So um, yes, it's hard to jump right in. Uh, it turns out that there's a few ways to look at it. Your most passionate users inside your company as a publisher are quite often in your customer service department, if it's a bigger organization. Your other most passionate ones are usually sort of in the product marketing or product management side. Um, those are where you can find the people sort of inside. Uh, Chris's point, Chris Webb says that there's already people in there using it. Find them. That's true. Every single day, and I had a really interesting case of that uh, reported on my blog, every single day there's somebody inside of an organization who's already doing this stuff and who gets sort of found out. And it's what the company does next that's interesting to me. Uh, the other question you'd had was sort of, um, you know, how many hours a day, that sort of a thing. And on that I call on my friends Tom and Ray Mayopti, the Click and Clack brothers, the Tappet brothers from uh, Car Talk on NPR. Don't drive like my brother. Uh, don't do it like me. I'm on the web many, many more hours than I usually recommend a company do. 
there's ways to mechanize all this. There's ways to have people do sort of monitoring. Uh, if it's a big organization, you can sort of use one full-time equivalent uh, type of staff position to get that done. And by that, I mean you maybe have three people doing shifts. Um, and, but because it's all mechanized and because you can start to sort of annotate and make that uh, more tooled, it gives you an opportunity to um, build a relationship uh, with that kind of content. It allows you uh, to, with the searching, say, for example, or blogging. Once you get into a habit of all this, it doesn't take a whole lot of time. What takes time is actually trying to expand and build relationships. People ask me a lot, you know, how do I have so many followers on Twitter? It's because I engage with people on Twitter all the time. It turns out the more engagement you do, the more opportunities you have to build a bigger relationship. I don't see any new questions up there, Mac. Did any swing by when I wasn't paying any attention? There was actually a question that had popped up um, early on, and it actually may have come in through the registration. And, it, and I think it has to do a little bit with um, managing institutional expectations. As you, as you probably know, a lot of publishing outfits are fairly traditional, um, and they're used to dealing with their audiences in a fairly uh, one-directional way. Are there things that folks who are getting involved in social media can do, reference points that they can use to sort of ease the transition a little bit? Um, are there touch points that you feel like can help with embracing transparency rather than being afraid of it? Any, any thoughts in that regard? Yeah, I mean, it, it's always, again, I love to be able to show numbers if I can. And so one way to sort of do that, and one way to sort of uh, build the connection with the senior team and how that they feel happy um, is if I can move a number. Don uh, mentions that, you know, publishers are thrilled with any kind of help they can get. I mean, these are tools to allow people to sort of go out and promote the things they're passionate about. Here's where companies get it wrong every single time. They want you to go out and promote the thing they're passionate about. And so GM did this in a really famously bad way with their Tahoe project. They said, we're going to release a whole bunch of video clips, and you can edit the clips and make your own video about how much you love the GM Tahoe. And boy, did they do it. Um, they put out the uh, video op clip opportunities, and all these environmental groups uh, made all these videos about how you're destroying the world when you're driving in the Tahoe, X, Y, Z, or you're taking jobs away, or you know whatever, you're killing seals. And um, the other thing that Jim did in that campaign was they allowed those things to go right onto the website's uh, front page without any kind of editorial process. So they were you know, shooting their own foot with a machine gun at that point. Um, but what they did wrong there wasn't, you know, please you know, interact with our media. What they did wrong there was, please talk about the car we want you to talk about. And a year or so later, when they finally uh, licked their wounds enough, they were daring enough to try again with a new approach. And they made a site called GM Next. And at GM Next, they had uh, a whole section that allowed you to tell stories about the cars you love. If you think about General Motors, they have cars like Corvette. Have you ever hung out with a Corvette driver or owner? Because none of them drive the car. They actually just keep it in the garage except for those two sunny days a year. Um, those people are rapidly passionate. And they really want to talk about it. So the publishers can kind of gain from this. Publishers can spend an opportunity of finding the people who are passionate about certain books or certain projects, certain information exchanges, and rev those up, and then maybe help find the sort of the follow-on stuff in the catalog that could be helpful. Man, when Harry Potter came out, there was a lot of really smart people who started putting out the Spiderwick Chronicles and Lemony Snicket and all those sorts of things. And as a bookseller around those times, somebody would come in and want a Harry Potter book, and I'd, I'd run out of them because it was a really small store, and we just couldn't keep them in track. And I would sell them Lemony Snicket. And actually, you know, I've, sell, I've sold them into yet another 13-book series. So it was an obvious great opportunity. Morris is asking a question here. Do I find that search traffic has saturated with time? Um, so yes, Google, the way Google works, and I am absolutely not an expert on that. Jacob Morgan is in the room. You could ask him probably. Um, Jacqueline, he's not on Twitter. That post actually said that he chose not to. Um, the way search is, is working is that if you write stuff that has good organic keywords in it, if you write stuff that has relevance to people, and if people link to that writing, then you will start to see better search results. That last part of it, when people link to it, is kind of the big experience. And um, it turns out that, like, say, Google Blog Search and those kinds of tools, you have to write stuff that's topical. And you have to write stuff that people are going to be searching on in the words that they're going to be searching on. 
And what you might start to do is you might start to do some kind of in-links uh, on your own blog with anchor text that matches that search text you're hoping they find. And I'm half talking on my butt, like I said, so definitely just talk to Jacob Morgan after this. He's at Jacob M on Twitter and you know, get the real details. But for example, if I wanted to rank for uh, social media strategy for publishers, well then one, I'd write a post called social media strategy for publishers. Two, I'd have some of that in the first few paragraphs. Three, eventually I'd write another blog post where I'd reference that post and make sure that the anchor text, meaning the, the blue text that you click on, would say something like that as well. Uh, looks like we're getting into the final stretch here. Um, just wanted to touch on a couple of things before we, we get to the conclusion. Uh, some folks are asking things like, uh, is there one specific social network that you would recommend? And I know that's kind of a uh, loaded question. But uh, beyond that, um, do you feel that there are certain social networks that tend to att attract certain crowds, for example, LinkedIn and a, maybe a business center crowd? And do you think that there are uh, benefits to trying to create your own social networks. I know that there are some initiatives, particularly within the publishing world, that have sought to create author-specific social networks. Um, and if you have any thoughts on in that regard. Uh, this goes back, I think it was Michael that asked the question, uh, if, if you build it, will they come? Um, a publisher making a publisher social network won't always work. Now, certain brands, and O'Reilly's lucky in this case, O'Reilly has very passionate users, and the reason is, um, you know, you're serving you're serving a, a pure informational product most of the time that has people who you know, almost immediately benefit or don't benefit from the book. Uh, so you know, you eat your young when it doesn't work out, and you have other books that just persist and persist and persist. And it's it's one of those things where you know O'Reilly could probably get away with a fairly active social network. But again, I mean, this is one of those things where publishers are looking at it from the outside looking in. But where I've got like you know those affinity keychains that have like you know your your grocery store tag, your video store tag, your gym tag on it, and all that. I mean, I look like a decorated general. I have so many social media accounts. So no, I don't really want to try yet another social network account. I probably want to just be where everybody else is. Um, when you talk, you know like the LinkedIn social network uh, for business books or whatever. I don't think so. I, the reason is because I think people are in there with a different mindset. They're not going to LinkedIn saying, how can I educate myself? They're going in there saying, how can I extend my business opportunities? That might be because they've lost a job and now they're looking. That might be because they're hiring. It might be because they're uh, looking to connect with other like-minded people. So remember the sort of uh, context questions. For example, if I have you over to my house and I make you a delicious steak dinner and you love it and I make creme brulee for dessert and you're having a good time and I pour you a glass of wine and the very last thing I do is I hand you a check, it's going to jolt you. You know, I've just changed the context entirely from what you thought was going on. I've told you you've got to pay on something that you thought was a dinner that I took you to. So we have to remember the context of selling as well. We don't go to a business network to sell. We go to a business network to sell ourselves. Um, so there are ways to start thinking about that. You might say, where are the contexts where I can sell? You know, as a guy who travels in and out of airports all the time, wow, there are some great opportunities in those airports. Harvard. Uh, Press is doing a lot in airports right now, and they've got stacks of books, and they always make me want to take a look. And I've got this sort of feeling of, you know, there's more opportunities like that than we're missing. There's more opportunities to have sort of like book vending machines. Why not? The minute any one of you just laughed at the idea of a book vending machine, I go buy those Best Buy vending machines in airports all the time now, or the Apple vending machines where I can buy iPods, I can buy PSPs, I can buy uh, little portable DVD players. And if you think no one's buying them, you haven't traveled cross country with a screaming child. There's a lot of people who suddenly want to get out there. Are there traditional publishers that you recommend that get social media marketing? Uh, you know what? I'll let them self-identify, Jacqueline, because they're all around you. They've been on this call this whole time. There's uh, all kinds of people who are in this space who are active, active, active on uh, Twitter and whatnot, who are actually pushing into these spaces in interesting and unique ways, <laughs> as Chris Webb identifies. Um, <laughs> Chris has been at this for years, and you know I, I give him a lot of credit because uh, he's out there, you know, sort of uh, daring the front lines for all the aspiring authors who think that just because they have a keyboard, they're an author. And uh, I know you all know that sort of feeling. And so I'd say that there's a lot of people who are trying all kinds of new stuff and really uh, paving the way for a lot of us in how social media is going to work. And yes, most of what I talked about on this call uh, was was somewhere between first and second steps and then way out there. 
And the reason I do that is not because I think I want you to feel like you're so far behind. I want you to understand how much further you can go down the road once you start paying attention to it. I mean, turning around a boat, turning around a d decent sized publishing house is not easy. Uh, and I've got a really small attack boat, so I can make it sound really easy to do all these different things. But you can start to retool. I mean, just to stick with the military analogy, because I've already done it, the US military had to retool dramatically over the last 15 years. Because it turns out we weren't fighting wars with giant nuclear weapons and aircraft carriers. It turns out we were doing small units street to street. Well, it's a whole different way to do war. And it's the same way with publishing. There's a whole new way to do publishing that has to happen. And it's up to you to decide what you want to do with that. Great. I think that's probably a good place to wrap it up. Um, Chris, thank sure. you very much for uh, hosting today's webcast. It was excellent. And I'm sure that folks got a lot out of it. Um, just a couple of notes at the end here. We will certainly be posting the full video from today's webcast on the Tools of Change for Publishing blog, which you can reach at toc.oreilly.com. That will be up relatively soon, and you'll receive a notification once available. But we also encourage you to keep an eye out there. Um, Chris will also be leading an in-depth tutorial on blogging and social media at the upcoming Tools of Change for Publishing conference, which will be held February 9th through 11th in uh, New York City. Uh, you can find more information on the conference and registration at tocon.com. That is T-O-C-C-O-N.com. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Mac. And everyone, um, I just want to mention, if you want to grab the chat, chat transcript, now is your chance. Um, the easiest way to get it is just to click in it, select all, and copy. And I'll give you a second if you want to post your Twitter address if you haven't done that yet. If you didn't, if you weren't logged in for the entire time and you would like the entire unedited transcript, just send an email to um, webcast. That's w-e-b-c-a-s-t at o'reilly.com, and I will we'll make sure that you get a copy of it. And I just want to say thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chris. What an excellent webcast, and thank you, Mac. You guys did a great job. I think everyone learned a lot here today. And uh, this was our last webcast for 2008, and we hope you'll all join us again in 2009 when we'll have another, some more to offer you. We should be playing some jazz music right about now. Sorry, I'm grabbing the chat transcript myself <laughs> before I forget. Just uh, it comes out more nicely formatted. And, and uh, in just a second, I am closing out the. Okay, there, got it. All right, thanks everyone. Talk to you again soon. Thanks.